Guess what? It's Sunday again. <clears throat> and we made it another week. That's what I love about children. I love about children. Today's message title will be Life's Footnotes. If you look at Romans <clears throat> chapter 3, verse 23, very familiar verse here, it says, For all have sinned and come short of the glory of God. Throughout life, we look at and we encounter people on a daily basis, but a lot of times, especially whenever we first meet them, we form an opinion of them. If you would, let's call it a footnote today. And my question will you, for you will be at the end of this message, what's going to be your foot, footnote for other people? Now I'm going to take five characters or five people out of the Bible and I'm going to demonstrate what their footnotes look like at the beginning and how we would probably form the same footnotes if we were writing the book. And then you're going to find out what God's footnote is on their lives. And you're going to have to compare, well, what was your footnotes compared to God's footnotes? And then at the end of the service, you're going to have to write your own footnote. And then you're going to compare it to what God wrote for you. So let's just go ahead and dive in. Very familiar character. The very first one is going to be King David. And as we see, King David <clears throat> committed sins of adultery, sins of deception, and murder in the story of David and Goliath, or David <clears throat> and Bathsheba. David became afraid and ran from Saul. David also had eight wives. Now, when you look at David's life, a lot of us, the first thing that we think about is David and Goliath, all right? But then it goes downhill from there, okay? Then we start reading about this, you know? He meets Delilah, commits the sin of adultery, deception, and even has Bathsheba's husband killed. <laughs> then stop there. David was going to be running from the king Saul at that time, and then David also had eight wives. Now that's just the highlights, that's just the footnotes of David's life, okay? But let's see what the scripture says. In 2 Samuel, verse 12 and verse 13, David said to Nathan, I have sinned against the Lord. And Nathan said to David, the Lord also has put away your sin. You should not die. Now we're going to go to Psalms 51, verse 1 through 4. <clears throat> Have mercy on me, O Lord, according to your unfailing love. According to your great compassion, blot out my transgressions. Wash away all my iniquity and cleanse me from my sins. For I know my transgressions and my sins is always before me. Isn't that so true? We want to forget our sins, but it's always right there in front of us. And that's what David is saying here. For I know my transgressions and my sins is always before me. Against you... You only have I sinned and done what is evil in your sight. So you are right in your verdict and justify when you judge me. But then we find out that God makes him king and forgives all of his sins. Now we forget that David was just like us. I mean, he was a shepherd boy. I mean, he was not born into being the king. He didn't have the bloodline or anything like that. So he had a rough life. He really did. We can go into great details, but because of time, we won't. 
But David faced what we faced. He faced sins. All right? And although his is highlighted, and maybe it's a little different than a lot of our sins, but nevertheless, we are faced with sins every day in our lives, and we just cannot blot them out. We can't just vanish them. They can't just disappear. David faced the same thing. But we've got to realize that those sins, when you ask Jesus Christ in your life, they're washed away. All right? They're no longer there. You're cleansed. David repented, asked God for forgiveness, and God forgave all of his sins. God went on to use him in mighty ways to glorify his name. Now that ends King David, but let's go to the Apostle Paul. Apostle Paul was another character that um, when you look at the end of his life, you wouldn't think that he went through everything, but he murdered, he harassed, and he prosecuted Christians in the early church. Now let's look at this. Now let's look at this person. All right? He murdered. He harassed. Not just people, but Christian people. And isn't it amazing how God just turned his life around? It really is. So if you're sitting here today and you think, you know, I've done so much wrong. Just think of the apostle. And just think that Paul murdered, harassed, and prosecuted Christians. But yet God was able to find favor in him and forgive his sins. Well, let's read on a little bit. <clears throat> Saul, or Paul, had a dramatic encounter with God on the road to Damascus. He repented, and, get, and God forgave him of all of his sins. The entire story of Saul's conversion in Acts 9, after Saul's conversion, he became known as Paul. And the Apostle Paul was not perfect, <clears throat> but he became extremely useful in God's hands, teaching, growing, inspiring, and encountering <clears throat> the early church. He went on to write much of the New Testament and continued to be a blessing to the believers every day. Paul, what a great testimony to God's forgiveness also. But when you look at his footnotes, a lot of people will only see that he was a murderer. He harassed people. And what he did to the early church, God turned all that around. Turned it all right around. And God used him as a mighty tool. So let's go to another very familiar character in the Bible, the Apostle Peter. Very familiar here. We talked about it a couple of weeks ago. He denied Jesus the first time. He denied Jesus the second time. And he denied Jesus the ter third time. Became an adversary speaking for the devil, trying to prevent Jesus from fulfilling his mission. Jesus had to rebuke him. And Peter failed many times trying to serve Jesus. But you've got to understand, just like us, we're going to fail. But unlike Judas, where Judas denied Jesus and betrayed Jesus and was not able to find forgiveness, we don't want to be that one. Never give up on the forgiving power that God has. So many times we think that, that we've done so much unworthy to be a Christian. But you can't commit that many sins 
that God cannot forgive it. When there's no hope and there's nothing but despair, you have nothing. So always keep a little hope. All right? Be a footnote that there is a hope in my life. We struggle so many times to forgive ourselves. But it's not about you forgiving yourself. It's about God forgiving you. Okay? That's the hope you need to hold on to. Forget yourself. Quit being so selfish and holding on to your sin. Who wants to keep that? But yet we do. You got to realize that's not you. Well, I mean, in a way it is, but it's really Satan just bringing in remembrance every time you open the door of what you've done wrong. And if he opens that door and you leave it open, man, don't expect him to get tired and leave because he's not. He's going to stay. He's going to take his shoes off. It's kind of like that mucus commercial. I know. It's disgusting. But just think of Satan in that. You know, coughing up that sin all the time. It's not a pretty sight. I don't even like the commercial, but I kind of get it. But that's exactly how Satan is. All right? Just take a little bit of Jesus. All right? Take a little bit of that mucinex. Jesus will clear it up. He won't bring it up anymore. Okay? Just remember that. Okay, let's go to... This is one that we don't talk about hardly ever. All right? You know who I'm talking about? Rahab. This is a character that pe preachers do not like to say and words that preachers don't like to say behind the pulpit. But she was a prostitute. She sold her body. She was dishonest. And she had a sketchy background. All right. I got a sketchy background. I didn't do prostitution. I didn't sell my body, but I had a sketchy background. But don't judge me. So do you. And if you don't, just think about this. If you're not willing to stand up here and tell you and tell the congregation everything that you have done, you just define sketchy. <laughs> so I have a sketchy background, okay? And so do you. So I won't hold it against you and I won't judge you. I'll leave that strictly to God. But I expect the same compassion and the same thought for me. Okay? I'll mind my business, you'll mind yours. But you'll pray for me, just like I'll pray for you. Okay, let's just see what the Word of God says about Rahab. She was used by God in a mighty way. She demonstrated great faith and helped the people of God. She is listed in the hall of faith. And she is listed in the direct lineage of Jesus Christ. In Matthew chapter 1, verse 5. But let's turn to James, second chapter. Verse 24 and 26. We're going to read this out of the NIV. You see that a person is considered righteous by what they do and not by faith alone. In the same way as not even Rahab, the prostitute, considered righteous for what she did when she gave lodging to the spies and sent them off in a different direction. As the body without the spirit is dead, so faith without deeds is faith. I mean, is dead. So how do you interpret that? Simple. Simple. Faith without deeds is dead. All right, let's just say we have faith. You got to do something with it. You just can't keep it to yourself. 
the hardest thing is to understand what faith is and then how to distribute that to other people. And it's just like the Bible. Okay, a lot of people don't read the Bible. A lot of people have Bibles, but they just don't read them. All right? And we've all heard the cliche that the only Bible people are going to see is you. Same thing here. A lot of time, the only faith that people will see is you. All right? We're common people. We're not really wealthy beyond, you know, we all need jobs. We all need income. We all have bills to pay and everything like that. So we're not one of the elite, all right? So when people look at us, they look at us as just common people. And that's a good thing. That really is. The more humble and the more down to earth you can be, the more people can relate. And if people can relate to you, then they're going to start looking at your life. And then they're going to notice, you know, there's something different about this person. I don't know what it is. I mean, she lives in the same town as I do. He works a secular job. They go to a simple church. But there's yet something different about them. When things hit hard, they seem to be able to make it through with a smile on their face, a a step on their and their walk it's just amazing how people of faith just have a different demeanor they never seem to be defeated they never seem to, to to get down on people that's what we need to be we need to be the Bible we need to be the faith that people see and when that happens they're going to realize it's not you and it's not me, it's God. And that's what we forget so many times. If people are looking at us for salvation, if they're looking for us for answers, they're looking in the wrong directions. At some point, we want them to look at us. We understand that. But then we have to transform from them looking at us to what holds us, which is God. So we've got to be able to be smart enough and intuitive enough to say, you know what? Yes, it's God inside me that makes a difference. You know what I'm saying? It just is. You know, you can look at someone and, and you know that they're struggling with something. You don't know what it is, but you can just see that facial expression. All right. And instead of putting a footnote in their life that they're beyond reach, uh, all they do is sin, they don't go to church, they don't do this. Well, let me tell you, just because you go to church, you think you're, you're, you're in some kind of Mickey Mouse club here. There's probably more sin in church than there is out in the world. Jeez, Brother Robert, why'd you say that? At least in the world, they know they're sinning. A lot of people in church that sin, they don't think they're sinning. And that's scary. You can call it being hypocritical. That's what the world does. All right. Boy, I didn't really want to go there. Because that's a hole that you get buried in and you can chase rabbits all day. But I just want to say this. Don't ever be comfortable in church to the point where you stop looking at your life. Because if you start looking at your life, you're going to look at something. And chances are you're going to start looking at other people. And then when you start looking at other people, all right, you're going to start judging them. And like we say, this is a judge-free church. We let God do the judging. Okay, we're too busy dealing with our lives to be able to judge your life. 
I know you get tired of hearing that, but we've got to drive that home. Because once we start judging people, it's a road you don't want to go down. You just don't. Let God do the judging. You just lift people in prayer. Never let it be said that Brother Robert judged that person instead of praying for that person. Because we don't want to be that way. I want to be known, you know, I was sinning. Pastor knew it. But he didn't judge me. He took me by my hand. He prayed with me. He didn't say, if you don't repent, you're going to hell. He showed me God's love. And because he showed me God's love, I found salvation. And that's all salvation is, is God's love. And accepting that God loves you. We think it's some big ordeal, and it is, but yet it's not. Because once you realize that God loves you, you've got the answers to every need in your life. When I got married, I thought Angel, my wife, had all the answers. She could do no wrong. Was I wrong? And she thought the same thing. And my sister can, can testify that there's been many a times where they've been in the bathroom and Angel was crying. Tears bawling uncontrollably. But as a couple, we were looking at ourselves for the answers. First of all, we were young. Not stupid, just ignorant. Going to church at times. Certainly raised in the church. But we were looking for each other for the answers. And we were missing one out of ten. We were missing two out of ten. And then it was nine out of ten. And then before we knew it, we were, we were, we were given Satan's answers instead of God's answers. Because we were depending on ourselves. The whole point of that is, don't look for ourselves and in ourselves for answers. Don't look at other people for answers. Don't think just because you don't like the way I preach or the way I teach that you can get on YouTube and look up another evangelist and he'll have all the answers. Let me tell you, let me, let me just stop you there. There's no evangelist, there's no preacher that has the answers. God has the answers. Now God will use those people to teach you and guide you. But don't look to people for the answer. Don't look at me. Don't look at the praise and worship team. Don't look at your youth pastor. Don't look at anyone other than God for the answers. But there's answers in us. Because how else are people going to see faith? How else are people going to know the Bible? Because it's very true. A lot of times, people will only see the Bible through us. As we go to West Virginia, eventually... It's coming. We're believing it, and it will happen. You haul or no U haul. It's going to happen. We're going to look back there, and we're going to see, or we're not going to see Sister Blue or Brother Jake back there. But I tell you what, you know what I'm going to do? Those days that I. I look back there and I see that pew or that spot empty. I'm going to look up here. And I'm going to look at this. Excuse me, messing it up. 
And this is going to be a remembrance. A seed planted. A ministry planted. So they will always be with us. They'll always be a part of us. This is their footnote for us. And what a wonderful footnote. Now there's other things. I mean, their, their laughter, their shaking of the skirt up here. Only some of y'all know what I'm talking about then. But that's the kind of footnotes I want to put on that family. I want to look at Matt and Aaron, and I want to put a footnote on there. That Aaron can always make you laugh. Always make you laugh, even when you don't want to. If you haven't experienced that, just go to Sister Jeanette's house whenever they're eating. And listen to her have a conversation. And I guarantee you, you will laugh. And then I will look at Matt, and my footnote on Matt will be kind of like the people that we had. There was a lot of bad in his life. But all there is is good now. There's forgiveness. And everything after forgiveness is what I want to focus on. And that's a footnote that I want for everyone. And, and that means everyone. All right? We all have a bad part of our life. All right? We all have those footnotes. But let's throw those footnotes away. Let's start a new set of footnotes. And let it be after forgiveness. And let's see what your footnote says after you've been forgiven. And if you can really understand what I'm saying here, at looking at your life after forgiveness, then you will never, ever again put a bad footnote on anyone else. I don't care what they've done to you. I don't care about the road rage. All right? Because once you find forgiveness, all right, then you're going to have nothing but good things. And that's what it is. And if your life is full of footnotes that you put on people, Change it to good. Before you write that footnote of bad, someone you met at Walmart or someone you drove by on the road or you saw at the grocery store or that you work with, find forgiveness and then rewrite it. Y'all stand.